anybody with a lot of time could go make a QR code to stick on the window that looks just like that and then just start social engineering people and they think they're interacting with a business but they're interacting with an attacker. I don't know. I'm just going to tell you, like I always tell people, keep your head on the swivel because like I said, in, in, corporate is more crucial than the streets. Like, that's... They some real gangsters. Corporate gangsters are some real gangsters. That's what you need to be watching out for. When an employer is trying to force an employee out of the company, it will often use a three-step playbook to get rid of that person. Hey, now today's some probably the happiest you will ever be is the day you come to work knowing you're about to type into it. This video is being brought to you by Level Up in Tech. It's Q3 in 2024, but you still have time to get into the cloud. With the quick search for cloud, indeed, you can see over 44,000 jobs are listed that is related or pertaining to the cloud. Now, that is a lot. But if you're watching this right now, you might be thinking, well, how do I learn the skills to get into the cloud? Well, we got you covered. Level Up in Tech is one of the best, if not the best, program related to getting people into the cloud. And Level Up in Tech, you can learn about server config and troubleshooting, the AWS cloud, infrastructure as code, CI, CD, scripting, containerization, and more. And also, they now also have a new multi-cloud AI engineering program that is dedicated to help you have the latest and greatest skills to help you be marketable in this tech market. They post more testimonials than almost any program that I could think of. Check them out. Wow. If you're ready to start your cloud career today, then use the link in my description to go to levelupintech.com forward slash tech so you can start your career. And plus, they'll know that I sent you. But on to the video. Top flight in the world, Craig. <laughs> Do that. And then he, uh, when they outside, he's like, man, I can't even do the James Brown. He was cutting pants. up. I, there, was a, there was a lot of scenes that just, you know, vulgar, you know, the whole movie. You can't talk to me that way. <laughs> Yeah. Movie what did he say to the lady in the car? He was like, or, uh, you got to give me your number before you can get out the car. <laughs> yeah. Before you can park here. We he said something like that. And uh, what he said, uh, I'm a paw. You ain't a paw. You a nigga that steal. I can't. I like the, y'all just love the movie. You ain't hear what happened to the last security guards, the whole entire movie. And nobody's saying what happened to the last security guards or even how it started is just ghetto. They got robbed on Christmas Eve. Mm -hmm. He broke in, stole their rent money. Come on now. It gets no more from the hood than that. And then they threw a party at the end Damon. to get the rent money. It was just a good movie. I said, Damon, I had a dream about <laughs> him last night. Damon. Uh, then they, um, I always laughed at it because it was like, holy moly Say it donut me. shop. Say it yeah, with buddy. me, buddy. Then he, after he said it, he was like, yeah, you get free donuts. The donuts and the flies. The did, donuts uh, and the flies. The donuts and the flies. Or or the uh the commercial uh, where the dads about, were what was it? Buh 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 something barbecue, something so good, make you make you want to smack barbecue. your mama. You tired of this, uh, he said, You tired of eating down the street where they give you more sauce than they give you meat? Well come down to the brothers barbecue. Tastes so good, make you slap your mama. Ain't that right, really? Yeah, boy. Bop, hey mama. Knock her down. <laughs> Or when he said, how we look? Like a damn snitch. That is funny. That movie's Shoot. hilarious. I am a boy, Cat Williams, it. he sealed the deal for the movie. For sure. He sealed the deal. He has to. He sealed the deal. He always, uh, anything he really acting, he do seal the deal in. True. To be honest. I didn't really like him in, he was good, but I didn't love him out of all the characters in first, is it first Sunday? I've never really watched that movie, to be honest. I've never he really still, He still outshined it everyone it else, like, but it's just not one of my favorite movies with him in it. Yeah, it didn't feel like a movie that I needed to watch. So I've probably seen bits and pieces of it, but it's not something I care about that much. For me, like uh, even when he was on Atlanta, he played like the alligator man. Like mm -hmm. he he played that part to a T. Definitely. He commits. So One thing about him, he going to commit to it. Mm -hmm. They make you want to watch some of his stuff. All the old ones. I think my favorite one is the one where the three of them went on tour. Him, Lunell, and the real light, light dude. What's his name? 
Yes. That's my that's like one of my favorite ones. It's so funny. It's the dude that was in the studio when him and that lady from the radio went back and forth. <laughs> he ate her up. And she, God rest her soul. Did she just pass away? <laughs> no. That's crazy. Like when we think about her, Literally. we think about that situation. He was like with that, that was suck. He was like, if you want to get some jewelry from the sick <laughs> Only one of us here is real. <laughs> Or did he say only one of us here is moving? He said, knock it off. <laughs> That's how you know a man is <laughs> aggravated. She should have stopped while she was ahead. Like, I think she was a comedian You're herself, too. You're not going to go toe-to-toe like, with him on live gotta air. Do. You got to... Well, you can. You just got to have a good sense of humor. You got to be able to bounce back. See, a lot of people can't... like. So a lot of comedians are funny with written com- material, but they're not good roasters. So it's only been a handful of people that's had the wit to roast back instantly on what you got on and whatever, like... That's why people would be scared to go to comedy shows. Who like, dang, I hope you don't pick me out of the audience. <laughs> so that's one of the things. Like, it's only a handful of them that like just roast anybody like in the Speaking crowd roast, instantly. And you just gotta respect it because you can't win if you don't have the mic. Speaking of roast, um, Tom Brady, one of the most cringiest things I ever seen in my life out of a roast. I thought that the Justin Bieber one was bad. Nah, they tore Tom up. You know what's funny? I never watched what? the other Well, I didn't watch the Justin Bieber one from beginning to end, but I saw enough clips to have watched it. But I watched the Tom Brady one, and it was so cringe. I had secondhand embarrassment for him. But it, but he was a good sport about it. Um, Dang, I just had a brain fart. But see, I never watched them because I always felt roasted and belonged to us. So I felt like if it wasn't in the style that I grew up roasting, I didn't want to watch it. So that's why... One of my favorite YouTube series is Roast Me because, like, that's how we used to roast, like, back and forth like that. Or somebody start laughing, you start roasting them. So that's the type of Did roasting you? I like. Another brain fart. Wow. Dang. You're good. Let's see. Um, Halloween-style movies. Yes. Or shows. Grotesque. Right. You know how to say that word? Grot- no. Grotesque. There we go. There we go. Grotesquery. I watched it. Did you watch it? Okay, I'll hold my, I'll hold my thoughts is. and opinions. <laughs> so it's giving American Horror Story, but not American Horror Story. It's by the same producer, that Ryan guy. But the lead in this first season is, oh, Niecy Nash. Niecy Nash and Angela Bassett's husband. What's his name? He plays her husband. And then she has a daughter. Uh, she's a singer. Yes, I think it's Courtney. Courtney, yep. Vance Courtney like is that. her husband. I'm not even going to give you the plot, but just know it's one of those shows. It's a it's a horror theme type of show. But just know the second season. You know how American Horror Story got the same characters, but like the story is the same. That is how it's mm-hmm. going to be. So like the first season, you literally have to watch it all the way until the very end of the first, the last episode. And then you're going to get hyped. Even though you're going out. I, I enjoyed the whole thing. I think it's only like maybe seven episodes, but it's going to be a hit for sure. I think they already are solidified for season two, but it was good. It was better than Devil. Way better. I know for me... um, what I've been watching, because you could have told me about it. I probably won't get a chance to watch it. I started, I got to go back and watch some episodes, but a good uh, show, surprisingly, is a show called Teacup. It's on Peacock. It's kind of weird. These people stay like in the uh, middle of nowhere where the, the family's like veteran, uh, vets. And it starts off with like some crazy Spanish woman talking into the forest and then you start saying all these weird things happen where these people can't cross certain blue lines. If you do, you die and taking over wild animals, killing and stuff. And it's, it's a, it's a pretty good. So I've been watching that found has season two on. So I've been watching found again. I don't know is if you saw season one of found. found is the people who pretty much most of them have been in some type of, thing where they've been missing or kidnapped and so now they dedicate their life to oh, finding nope. missing people. Never seen that. No, I'm thinking about lost. It's very different. I'm thinking about and lost. Yeah. Yeah. Found is cool because they got like a tech security dude on the team and he like is scared to leave. It's like he got kidnapped so bad he's scared to leave his house. But he's like a beast on like hacking hmm, into anything. Check that out. So it's pretty good. Uh it's on Peacock and I know you're talking about scariest movies. 
You know what's funny? I'm able to watch scary movies because I tell myself in my mind they're not real. So I'm like that too, but I can still say a movie is scary or not. But the like top three, Exorcist of Emily Rose, number one, Shook. Was she psychotic or was she possessed? I'm going to go with possessed. That was a really good movie. She ate that role down. If you want to be scared, watch that. Um, 13 Ghosts, Mm -hmm. just because when I was a kid, that was like the first scary movie that had me scared to go to the bathroom, get up out the bed, turn the lights off. And The Strangers, just because it's realistic. I always say that it's just a realistic movie. But all in all, it takes a lot to make me scared. Like, I'm not going to have nightmares or anything like that when I watch a scary movie. Mm Mm-mm. I'm not going to be tiptoeing and running around the house. None of that. <laughs> For me, I don't like to watch certain stuff at the house. But, like, my favorite probably scary movie franchise is Insidious. Like, I got people that won't watch, will not watch Insidious with me. And I was like, it's very like interesting. Insidious. It's not scary. That was a, that was a and, good uh, horror s- series. What about, what about place- Annabelle? The Annabelle's. I, mean, I never watched Annabelle, so I watched like The Quiet Place. Um, I think that's what's called. Uh, I've seen um, The Jeepers Creepers. Um, I like The Hills Have Eyes too. Two. I've seen. It's this movie. Well, they're more. They're not scary. They're just like weird. So this happened. I think it's Stephen King stuff, and it. I like it's it. not scary to me, but I some used people to be are scared, scared of it. it. The the OG when I was a kid, the movie for sure. Georgie Pennywell, Pennywell Georgie. Um, <laughs> the Devil's Rejects was alright. Um, of course, Paranormal Activity. Um. What's the one? What's the one with the people? I was never scared of that because it's like things, disfigured. They were like a group of men, and they were real big and disfigured in the woods. And they used—I cannot think of what. But there's like mm-hmm. wrong turn, wrong turn. All of them, all of the wrong turns are good. Ah, uh, Jeepers Creepers is okay. I would—I would rather watch Freddy versus Jason than any other. See the no Bride of Chucky is the best Chucky movie. Um, hmm. Bride of Chucky. Did you ever watch The Human Centipede? I'm not a scary, like, well, no. I'm like a suspense thriller type of person, but I'm not a, I don't know. Some of the stuff I feel, be feeling like, like white people <laughs> movies, so that's why I don't mean. Like, the Human Centipede like, definitely is. Like, prime example. Prime example of why I feel like that. I'm playing for my gamers out there. Um, I was playing Resident Evil 2. And it was cool. I like the story, the stuff that was happening with the zombies. But the stuff that I'd be doing in the game, I'd be like, bro, this is some white people stuff. Like, I'm like, bro, if this was me and I was a cop in a, a police station with zombies, I would not be doing all this. I'd get in a car and I'd leave that town. Speaking of, but, from, <laughs> uh, I've been watching that too. Yeah, I, I, people have been telling me to watch it. I just hadn't gotten a chance to because... I try to watch as minimal series as possible, time. so I'm not just trying to watch on this TV and crap. So I'm going to get to I it because I think I don't know how third, many seasons so, yeah. it's got, but it's got enough. And you know he's a good actor. He gonna sell that. Ro- he be so stressed out. <laughs> It'd be so good. Welcome back to the Sexual Talk Podcast. I'm your host HD, and we got our other host with us today, Cyber Shorty, and we back for another episode of Current Events, Laughs, and Career Advice. But if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, you know what to do. Leave us a comment, review, download the podcast, share it out. It really helps us out in the algorithms. And if you're watching us right now on YouTube, like, hit the bell icon, be notified when we're dropping everything. And look, a lot of y'all that's watching, not subscribed, and we're going to need that to change. So go ahead and do that. It don't cost you nothing to subscribe, and it can help us out a lot. Now, we got some good topics for y'all. Um, you probably heard some of the better in the beginning. Well, I guess I can say one thing. Like, I made a tweet about uh, you could tell about certain people's or well, certain companies' DI strategy based on your interview process. And I didn't elaborate on that tweet on Twitter or X just because I felt like what uh, what's understood don't have to be explained. What I meant by that is if I was to do a poll of every black person that said when they went through their, through their many interview processes, They'll probably be able to count on the number of hands of how many people that look like them they interview with. So when I make that statement, that's what I mean. 
And uh, I don't think a lot of companies, either they don't have the people or they're not putting enough effort into maybe saying, okay, let's at least put somebody that look like them in the process so they feel a little bit more they comfortable. They don't think about it. They don't care. They never, they, they never they cared care. less. That's the lowest thing on a totem pole. And uh, it's funny enough, I did a consult with a, a guy today and we were actually talking about the same thing. He brought it up. I say, listen, trust me, I understand. I've been through it. Sometimes you feel like you're just a token interview person or you don't have anybody that's going to bat for you. Like we talked about on your behalf. And I was saying how anybody who gets in these comments, if they're in the majority of people that typically interview for tech roles, they're going to say we're crying or race baiting. But it's not really that. It's really sometimes like I know when I ain't do good. But then sometimes you're just like, Am I just a person I'm interviewing? Like, who do they want to hire? Are there similar archety- archetypes to their self? And so those are things you're thinking about because you're like, you go interview after interview, interview after interview, interview after interview with these people that don't look like you. And a lot of times, there have probably been times you felt like you killed it, but you didn't get the nod. So you're like, I want to know what's going on. Like, would my chances have been different if I said somebody else there to say yes for me? It's like, why are y'all saying no? Why not get this guy? Or, hey, let's open up another rec then if that's the case. Because what's the difference between this person? These are all questions that are hard for people to probably answer when it comes to actually answering them without incriminating their company. But I believe these are things that happen and we need to, I don't know, the only way really to get past that is to get more of us in or just start your own businesses. And more and more, I've seen more and more uh, minorities starting their own business just because like the hoops and everything we have to jump through just to get interviewed or get hired or matter of fact, let's segue into this and then we'll get into one of your articles. I made a post and it was talking about how I don't believe interviews are the best measurement of seeing if a person will succeed in a role. And I aching that to the NFL combine. If you watch the NFL combine for my football fans, you know, that people go through and do these drills and you can have a person look crazy doing these drills, like the best of the best. Then it comes to putting the pads on Sunday, say don't translate over. So there are people who can perform very well in interviews. They can answer all the Google questions. They know how to do everything in a star format, everything right. But they are not the best person for the job sometimes. Whereas the person who's doing the um, ums and they just probably don't necessarily retain all the information that they do on a day-to-day well to answer it enough for you, if you put those people in a do-or-die situation, they're going to exceed way better than those other people. So I think that the method of interviewing sometimes needs to change. It needs to be um, less BS, Google stuff, and more assessments, more things that could you could tangibly see how this person thinks and how they solve this problem. Or... Maybe ask some questions like giving them uh, homework, not something that's going to require much time. But, hey, these are some issues we've run into. How would you address them? And you could tell if a person um, Googled it or what you may do for that is say, OK, we're going to give you three hours to to do this versus you got so many days. So you can see people just strung stuff together on Google. Like, I think they just need to remap it and try different things because I think right now the process oh, yeah. is broken. I think broken. it's broken. I know I run into so many people. Right. I run into so many people that should have jobs that don't. And I'm like, what? And then like I always tell people when you get to work and you work with some of these people, you like, how are that you? That part hiding? right there. That part right there. I don't know what's going on out here between HR, the recruiters, what the hiring manager actually needs, and then the skill set that's being brought forth and then cutting off the applications because you got too many, but they were all terrible candidates or you cut out. I just, how do you even, it's, yeah, it's. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the thing. Like, so like one of the things you could do sometimes is, Hey, and this is why companies try to hire people that have all the qualifications because they can find themselves in trouble. If you say, okay, Hmm, I made it to the end. Who they hired after me? Just try to search a new post and say they started at whatever job and see who announces it on LinkedIn and then go see what type of skill set they have. And then if you feel a way, like present it. Now, sometimes they may ignore you, but like some companies be dead wrong. <laughs> and you'd be like, bro, you wasted my time. You ghosted me. You made me get up early. I took off work sometimes for y'all. Unpaid. Bye. And then we're reciprocated. 
Right. I'm a big fan of, hey, if, if you know your interview process long or you're a certain caliber of company, hey, pay these people to interview with you. Y'all have the money. Like, do it. Especially if you know you're, you're wasting the time where you already know who you want to hire. That happens a lot. But that's just me and my soapbox. <laughs> and, oh, I'm glad you had the Change Healthcare joint because I meant to add that on there. But, you know, I sent that to you whatever data it was, and it said it's affected 100 million people. Then you said there's more. But that was funny to me because, remember, we read whatever letter and or something they gave that. us, and it was like, it, it only affected nothing about like 100, that. nothing about a million. That's a third of the uh, United States. Yep. Let me, I'm trying to find it. Okay. Change healthcare. <clears throat> this one is going to be good. So how the ransomware attack at Change Healthcare went down a timeline. So we know that this happened earlier. So it says months after the February data breach, a substantial proportion of people living in America are receiving notice by mail that their personal and health information was stolen by cyber criminals during the cyber attack on Change Healthcare. At least 100 million people are now known to be affected by the breach. And then I'll just start with the timeline. So in February 20, February 21st of this year, they first reported outages as a security incident basically began. So the billing systems at doctor offices and healthcare practices stopped working and insurance claims stopped processing the status page on Change Healthcare's website was flooded with outage notifications affecting every part of its business. And then later on that day, the company confirmed that they were experiencing a network interruption related to a cybersecurity issue. Obviously, something was going on. So they did go ahead and invoke their security protocols. They shut down their entire network in order to isolate intruders it found in its systems. Uh, so that meant sudden and widespread outages across the healthcare sector that relies on a handful of companies like Change Healthcare to handle healthcare insurance. So in February, they confirmed they were hit by ransomware. Um, it says after initially and incorrectly attributing the intrusion to hackers working for a government or nation state, they later said on February 29th that the cyber attack was in fact the work of a ransomware gang. Um, so they're saying that the gang represented itself as Alpha V or Black Cat. Um, and so they say a dark web leak site associated with the Black Cat gang also took credit for the attack, claiming to have stole millions of Americans' sensitive health and patient information. Black Cat is a known Russian-speaking ransomware as a service gang. Its affiliates are contractors who work for the gang break into victim networks and deploy malware developed by their leaders. Um, so they basically take a cut of the profits that are collected from the ransoms collected from the victims in order to get their files back. So then in March, United pays a ransom. So they paid 22 million on or to the hackers who then disappeared. Um, so the ransomware gang vanished after they got the money. The gang's leak site on the dark web, which weeks earlier took credit for the cyber attack, was replaced with the seizure notice claiming that the UK and US law enforcement took down their sites. So they basically put on a scheme. They got the money and then pretended like their site had been taken over by law enforcement. But the FBI and the UK authorities basically said that wasn't us. Um, so basically they were pulling off an exit scam. So they paid the 22 million and that included a link to that Bitcoin transaction as proof. But despite losing their share of that ransom payment, the affiliate said that the stolen data is still with us. Um, so they paid a ransom to hackers who left data behind and disappeared. Uh, so that's what the site allegedly looked like. March 13th, widespread disruption across US, U.S. healthcare amid fears of data breach. So weeks into the cyber attack, outages were still ongoing with many unable to get their prescriptions filled 
or having to pay cash out of pocket. Military health insurance provider TRICARE said all military pharmacies worldwide were affected as well. On the 28th of March, U.S. government ups its bounty to $10 million for information leading to basically black cats capture. Um, April 15th, contractors form new ransom gang and publishes some stolen health data. So, and then there were two ransoms, that is, by mid-April, the affiliate set up a new extortion racket called Ransom Hub, and since it still had the data that it stole from Change Healthcare, it demanded a second ransom from United Health. In doing so, Ransom Hub published a portion of the stolen files containing what appeared to be private and sensitive patient records as proof of their threat. April 22nd, United Healthcare says ransom where hackers stole health data on a substantial proportion of people in America, which happened two months after it actually occurred. May 1st, their chief executive testified that they were not using basic cybersecurity. Um, so the hackers broke into their system using a single set password on a user account not protected with MFA. We know that to be a basic security feature. Um, so one of the biggest data breaches in U.S. history was entirely preventable was the key message. And in June, they started notifying effective hospitals and medical providers on what data was stolen. July, they started notifying affected individuals by letter. And then this month, what yesterday, they confirmed at least 100 million people were affected. So, yeah, that's a timeline on what exactly happened during that entire scandal. The fact that they paid the money and didn't get it back ran off on a plug twice uh, ran off saying? on a plug twice and ran off on a plug <laughs> twice was a person right i need to find it on tiktok just to put it right there but uh drake got the oh uh uh-uh, you ain't gotta be drake uh what bruno mars song Man. is dripping in finesse they got me in finesse it don't make no that's what they sense were saying when they ran off how they got finesse <laughs> like that for 22 million and still didn't get the data back and then just not notifying people in july and now in October saying, oh, by the way, it was about 100 million of y'all. It was way more. Yeah. And then, they, you know, they're, they're, they've been hiring. But it's like, at this point, like y'all, sh- y'all should just be getting people jobs. Don't even make it tough. Clearly just hire you need people. Them. You didn't have MFA established. Probably. So that means they need to go ahead, do a sweep, and, you know, tighten up. <laughs> The network's so large, though, and it's just one of the things where it should take a minute for them to get on the umbrella because it's falling on kind of United Healthcare, but it really is more a change because of uh, how they was already established. And I know from personal experience how that environment probably was. I'll just keep it like that. If you want to know how I know in the Patreon, you can ask me how I know. But when you're taking over a company, that's one of those big things. Like, are y'all going to get on our infrastructure? If, if then by when, if not, how robust is your uh, security uh, structure right now? Like what are you susceptible to? And so they probably should have had some third parties do some better audits of those things. And they probably did. They probably just said, you know, nobody will break into us and, and not hit the way this. to go about it. But I think, I think that, there needs to be a better process involved. I don't think that there's, I don't know, but I don't think that there's one universal structured way to approach um, an a- acquisition. Um, because on a, from a security perspective, just like from a business perspective, it's a big deal. You could be bringing something in that is making you extremely vulnerable. And it's, you bought them. So now, you know, your rep is on the line. So I don't know. I don't know. I just think it's a hundred million people, people not being oh, able to fill right. prescriptions. What? Some people have prescriptions that they can't miss. People got insulin yeah, and, and those are those real just ones. what? Like imagine, and I hope it didn't happen, but imagine if I'm somebody sure died during someone the breach. did because it was so t- they they still didn't even get it right. And you know, once it goes south, then you have to figure out because it sounds like they weren't even prepared with backups, you know, like whatever their their plan was going to be. 
imagine how long it took to find to figure out, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do X, Y, and Z. All that time wasted, things weren't, prescriptions weren't being filled and so on. Insurance claims, like, imagine you need emergency surgery, like just... It's way bigger than just 100 million people's data were, was exposed. Like people were significantly impacted on a day to day from a health perspective. 100%. Like, psh, listen, I couldn't agree with you more. That's, that's crazy that it had to come to that. Let me adjust this real quick. Okay. There we go. Cool. All right. Now to switch topics really quickly on something a little bit different, I thought it'd be pretty cool. A lot of people love Notion. They rave about Notion. I'm not the biggest Notion fan. I felt like it was more complicated than it should have been when I was trying to use it. So I stopped. But there are a lot of people that swear by Notion. They live by Notion. Notion has helped them change their life. All hell Notion. Notion is getting ready to launch an email client. So it's more of a Gmail client than a traditional email service. The idea here, Notion says, is to build an email experience that allows users to ditch the old ways of a rigid inbox and embrace a new way where email works for you and your workflows. When exactly Notion Mail will launch, though that is still a question mark, the company is only committing to soon at this point, but there's a wait list for getting early access. With adding Mail, Notion, which says it now has over 100 million users, continues on its path to offering a more fully featured suite of productivity options. The launch of Notion Mail, after all, comes only at the few months after the company launched its calendar product, Notion Calendar. It's worth noting was the product was an acquisition with the company buying calendar app Cron in 2022. You know what I did? I actually interacted with somebody that had a Notion Calendar, and it works pretty good. So... Similarly, Notion recently acquired Skiff, a security-centric platform that also included an NN encrypted email service. It doesn't come as a surprise then that the Notion Mail is taking some design cues from Skiff, but the company's focus here isn't so much on security. Though I'm sure that's top of the mind for Notion as well, but an integration with Notion AI. So I guess this is how it's supposed to look. There seems to be two parts of the AI integration here. Automatically organizing your emails by using an AI prompt as a kind of smart filtering mechanism. Think label all recruiting emails by stage and show the role. That's pretty cool. As well as the ability to let Notion AI handle the tedious back and forth, such as scheduling and follow-ups. The company said how well that works in practice remains to be seen. One nice feature Notion Mail will offer that I often wish Gmail would is that it doesn't just allow for using different filters, but also allows you to prioritize emails inside of those filtered views. Gmail, on the other hand, only offers the priority inbox view in the main inbox. But when you drill down to any of the default categories like forms, updates, or social, your only option is a reverse timeline. Another integration worth highlighting is with Notion Calendar, users will be able to add a scheduling button to their emails that links them right to their calendars and availability. In addition to mail, Notion is also launching a number of other new features. These include Notion Forms, which let users design forms and collect information with Notion as the database backing it, as well as the ability to more easily customize layouts in Notion to better suit a user's preference for how to display tasks, notes, docs, and more. Notion is also launching some improved automation features, including the ability to connect Notion and Gmail to, for example, notify people via Gmail. And to round all this out, Notion has updated its marketplace with a redesigned web experience. I mean, I might try it out, though. I love, like for me, a solopreneur, I love apps like that. I love stuff that kind of makes it a little bit easier on me. That's what I was telling you earlier. When people ask me about how I do, how do I mostly produce and edit all this stuff, I was like, AI. AI has helped me trim the fat on like a lot of the stuff I do. And you would think like uh, my guy Chris earlier from Tech Woke was like, bro, I thought a professional was editing your podcast. I was like, no, it's me. I don't. <laughs> it's uh, me. They lost. I don't like tools where people can put time on your calendar without talking to you. So I hate that. I mean, I don't think I don't think they'll be able to do say, it. Say it again. Giving it to them. I don't think they'll be able to put time on your calendar without you giving yeah, them I the never, link to your calendar. Mm -mm, no, I hate it. Really? That's no, I mean, I, I know that makes sense, but I don't even, I'd rather just tell you. It works better. Like, so as long as you can get granular in it, like for me, if it's Calendly, nobody could book. Like if you wanted to, if let's say today is 11 p.m., 
uh, October 25th. You can't decide at 11 p.m. At 11.30, you want to have a console with me. It's going to make you book for tomorrow at 11. A, yeah. So, a leading um, time, basically. Yep. I like that. So, yeah. yeah. So, I think it'll be something like that. Some It'll take a lot of cues out of Calendly. Man, I don't know. Like, this AI space and all stuff is heating up because now it's like, okay, how do you keep on improving? How do you keep on improving? I, I like it. It makes me want to try that out. And especially with the, the email feature, think about how many emails you're going through. And like you said, Hey, you can probably make a prompt. Hey, go through my emails with recruiters and give me a summary of where I'm at in the process or like what's the, next. I like the. I would like to nature. try it as a calendar, not as an email service, though. It's too much automation that I'm not going to hmm, be familiar I love you. with. Yeah. Like maybe to test it out, but just to be like, oh, this is what I'm about to be utilizing going forward. Yeah, I forgot what you referred to. You referred to it's like early adopters. And I forgot what the other term is. So you're definitely not in the early adopters, people. Bring it to me, fix. Thank you. I forgot, but you know it makes sense though. You're you're pretty much a, a, a Apple relax. stand. So relax, it makes sense. relax. <laughs> <laughs> and it is, and it is. So it make it make a lot of sense. But I thought that was pretty cool. I think that. Ooh, that's a pretty good one. You got a lot of. I know, I know. I know. You got a lot of good stuff on here. I don't know what you want to talk uh, about. Next. I'm gonna talk about the Tesla stuff. There's not a lot of okay. information that I could find on Tesla's site about the bot, but I did talk to someone who has actually been to the Tesla um, store dealership in. I think they said Fort Worth and they actually have the bot there. It's not moving around, but you are able to see it. But let's go ahead and give my thoughts and opinions. So Tesla's Optimus robot as explained by Elon Musk. So this is just saying they got finally got a look at a working prototype of Tesla's first foray into robots. So Optimus, as it's been dubbed, was initially introduced as a concept at the company's 2021 AI Day. And despite the hype Elon Musk has thrown behind the humanoid, there's still a lot of mystery surrounding what exactly Optimus is designed to do. Um, so what is the timeline? Um, Musk says that the company's goal is to make a useful humanoid robot as quickly as possible. I don't know if that's a good thing. Musk's ambitions are particularly high, but seeing as Teslas are fairly commonplace electric vehicles, there's a chance we could see Tesla bots in real life in the not so distant future. How mobile is it? Um, so it has 28 degrees of freedom. That's far lower than what the human body provides. But Optimus still has many degrees of freedom in its hand and even two degrees of freedom in its thumbs to give it some opposable action. Um, so it looks like it has articulating hands that were designed to operate tools and do useful things, as Musk puts it. He also previously mentioned applications in caring for the elderly and, of course, working in Tesla factories. How commercial will Optimus be? Um, it says Tesla will likely be producing millions of units. It's clear that Tesla wants to mass produce Optimus bots as much as its cars, but we're not sure that everybody really needs a robot. How much will it cost? So it's probably less than $20,000 during a I day is what Musk said. We're not sure what the going rate for a humanoid bot is these days, but Musk compares it to Tesla cars, noting that the bot will be much cheaper. If this is the right price point, we could see um, Optimus bots become the standard of the humanoid robot market. So this is just showing how it's grown. My boy done got beefy. He a big dog. When will Optimus be ready? Musk acknowledges that there's still a lot of work to be done to refine Optimus and improve it. He notes that this is only the first version of Optimus and that Tesla is looking to expand its AI team to further develop its task. That's about it. Interesting. I thought about when you said, uh, either say, you he is, I was thinking about the, she don't want to 
a puppy, she want a big dog. <laughs> I was trying to think this of it, but I was going to mess it up. But yeah. Um, my first initial thoughts. Ooh, I want to see it in person. It excites me. I'm still a little nervous, especially. So how can you be a about, about something that's going to probably backfire gonna, on us versus it's definitely the email backfire, app. Especially he when he said machines. he's trying to make it as fast as possible. What's the rush? Perfect it. Um, price point wise. $20,000 is a lot of money for the average person. However, if we're thinking about it in terms of a vehicle, right? It's not that expensive. I thought it was going to cost way more than that. I honestly thought it was going to be more like 50, 60, maybe 80,000 um, for it. Caring for the elderly and children, but you're still giving limited details. Like, all the stuff it was doing, interacting, cracking jokes, walking around, talking to celebrities. I saw um, somewhere where it said that some of those bots that were at the event were actually being controlled by people. So it's like, are you selling us a facade? Are you not even there at all or what? And then are do you got to worry about them being controlled by people when you purchase them? Yeah. I'm still interested though. Like I would, if I could test one out, I would test it out for sure. But like for like a couple of days, just to get my feet wet and see if that's something I'm interested in. But like watching kids and all that crazy stuff, no. But if he could be like Bicentennial Man, he could come stay with me. He was so kind hearted. See, you thinking about, you know what's funny? People thought the Y2K was going to be watching like the who? Jetsons. How, I don't, you're not supposed to ask your, I'm only like, how, what's our difference in yeah, age? Like two, three about. years? So do you remember when they was finna say it's going to be the year 2000? Yeah, they thought the world was going to end. And then they Again thought, in like, 2012. Yeah. Flying cars. And yes. they thought it was going to be like the Jetsons. So that's what I was talking about. Like, you know, Jetsons had the, the um, robots and all that kind of cartoon stuff. Oh, no. I don't, I see use cases for, I don't see use cases for the average family. I see family. use cases for um, supply chain, industrial type environments. Um, assembly line type of but that's trade-off, it's a trade off because if it's twenty thousand dollars, let's say you pay the workers in the factory sixty thousand dollars, and so you got a hundred workers, that's what six hundred thousand plus the repair, plus the maintenance, plus the updating. No, 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 I'm just talking about people. I'm saying all these people at the factory they get they make sixty thousand dollars a year, so getting rid of a hundred people, you clearing up. Uh, sixty thousand dollars, and you can get them same hundred people for twenty thousand dollars, which is going to be two hundred thousand dollars. So you're going to save four hundred thousand dollars. What if somebody hacks that thing? So that's going to be the other part of jobs. So, like for example, we got IoT, we got uh, ICS, we have uh, self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles. So these are kind of the emerging technologies that are going to need more security more programming, all the other stuff. And so that's where people got to sometimes probably start looking at a pivoting I into. Also, and then there would be... I also found out no, today ahead. that if you have a Tesla and you try to hack it, your warranty is uh, voided. Like off bat, they're done. You're done. I don't, so I don't know, but you to- my homeboy told me he has a Tesla. He told me today. He said there's some guy on, I think maybe YouTube, who like is known for hacking his Tesla. So I'm not sure. I mean, obviously that, that probably happened to that guy. That is a good question though. How do they know that you were intentionally trying to do it? Because someone could be trying to hack your Tesla. So that is a good note, good notion. I never even thought about that either. I just was like right. thinking about if you were doing it yourself. Right. Because I mean, um, what is the, what's the thing called? Yeah. Non-repudiation. So that's a thing of always trying to see something. And before I get into my subject, that makes me think about like when people bring text messages and stuff in play or stuff that happened like on social media. I said, well, do these lawyers and everybody else go through to figure out non-repudiation? Do they give a subpoena to Meta and say, hey, we need to see what IP address like this comment or what was using it at that time. Because anybody can have access to somebody's yeah. account and say it was them. But that don't mean it was them. So that's all I was thinking. And, um, you know, Tori trying to get out of jail. We're going to see how, what, what happens with that. 
the appellate court. Um, they, they about to hear him out or something. Yeah, I think he got a good shot unless they pay the right people some money to keep him in. Just because, you know, people, if they get this far in the pot, it was a shoddy case. Like, I don't care what nobody say. If you was following it from day by day, it should have been way longer. They rushed the judgment and stuff didn't happen. Drivers came out way after people was in jail and gave their kind of things. It was a mess. Uh, you could tell it was kind of a real road job. So hopefully they redo it. And yeah, uh, that's what about all I got to say on that. Um, I haven't been keeping up with like everything. All I know is like that murder for hire type stuff. I listen, when certain rappers say stuff, <laughs> I believe them. Niggas. Like, no, for real. When I used to have to go in the office, I was listening to. Uh, Big Brr, what song is that? I know Poop Shiesty. Yeah. Back in Blood. Yeah. When it's, if a nigga killer ain't there, you shouldn't be wearing no R.I.P. shirt. And uh, he said, Poo, no, I'm really shiesty. I believe them. The, the beat is so sinister. I said, I need to I need to listen to something else. I believe these That's dudes. That's drill. I know who, I know, I know who faking and I know who telling the truth. You can yep. see it. When the dude got out of some song, like, why you woofing on that? And then I thought she was a thug. The song like, is so gangster. You can, I don't need no security. Just like you said, listening to people. Like when I, when you, for Mo3, for example, when you listen to him, don't let the melody of the nice song fool you. Listen to the lyrics. Listen to what he said. He said they scared to come outside. Okay. He said they know we step in night and day. Okay. <laughs> Until it hurts, it ain't no mercy. Mm -hmm. Let's get into this one. I thought this was pretty cool. Black Basta. I wonder why they picked that name. Ransomware poses as IT support on Microsoft Teams to breach networks. That's pretty interesting. The Black Basta, the Black Basta ransomware operation has moved its social engineering attacks to Microsoft Teams, posing as corporate help desk, contacting employees to assist them with an ongoing spam attack. Black Basta is a ransomware operation active since April 2022 and responsible for hundreds of attacks against corporations worldwide. After the Conti Cybercrime Syndicate shut down in June 2022, following a series of embarrassing data breaches and the operation split into multiple groups, with one of these factions believed to be Black Basta. Black Basta members breach networks through various methods, including vulnerabilities, partnering with malware botnets, and social engineering. In May, Rapid7 and ReliQuest released adversaries on a new Black Basta social engineering campaign that flooded targeted employees' inboxes with thousands of emails. These emails were not malicious in nature, mostly consisting of newsletters, sign-up confirmations, and email verifications, but they quickly overwhelmed the user's inbox. And yeah, I want to stop right there because like I tell people now, and I've worked with stuff like this before, and it's not to the level of uh, dealing with a known threat actor, but it's still a threat actor to where they don't just go for the juggler from the beginning. They just want you to talk back and forth with them to eventually they send you something to compromise you. And then they start interjecting themselves in your threads to figure out, OK, do you deal with the money or not? That's something you do when you see the typos quite domains and stuff. And now they'll, they'll make them have a name that looks just like yours, but it's different. But let's get back mm -hmm. in this. The threat actors within Call the overwhelmed employee posing as their company's IT help desk to help them with their spam problems. During this voice social engineering attack, the attackers tricked the person into installing the AnyDesk remote software tool or providing remote access to their Windows devices by launching the Windows Quick Assist remote controller screen sharing tool. Now, you and I talked about this with the North Korea remote workers. The issue here is that you should be able to be prepared for employees' negligence or ignorance. They shouldn't be able to install any of those tools on your network. So even if they try to install it, it should say, hey, you need somebody from help desk to install this. Yep. yep. Put a ticket in. And then they're going to say, hey, this is not the proof when we use. And then they're going to say, why do you need this? Because most of the help desk, I think help desk uses either it's, uh, it's log me in or bomb guard or these other ones where they'll send you something, you accept it, and then they log in and then it goes away. You're not really uh, downloading like a software per se. So they've kind of gone away with all that stuff. So that is something you can mitigate easily. But let's keep going. From there, the detectives will run a script that installs various payloads such as Screen Connect, Net Support Manager, and Cobalt Strike, which provide continued remote access to the user's corporate device. They are maintaining persistence. Now that the Black Boss affiliate has gained access to the corporate network, they were spread laterally to other devices while elevating privileges, stealing data, and ultimately deploying the ransomware encryptor. 
Moving to Microsoft Teams, in a new report by ReliQuest, researchers observed BlackBox affiliates evolving their tactics in October by now utilizing Microsoft Teams. Like the previous attack, the threat actors first overwhelmed an employee's inbox with this email. However, instead of calling them, the attackers now contact employees through Microsoft Teams as they start on users. Where they impersonate corporate IT help is contacting an employee to assist them with their spam problem. The accounts are created under intra-ID tenants that are named to appear to be help desk like security admin helper dot on Microsoft dot com support service admin. So, and actually, I'm going to try to do this real quick. It's going to be a brief interjection because I want to, you know, I think we need to do a little bit more teaching on this pod. It's pissing me off because my thing is doing this. I know what I'm looking for. Give me a second. And finesse is stuck in my head. So this is kind of pretty, a little smart by them, but you got to pay attention to the details. I'm going to share this tab instead. All right, guys. So I went to who is to figure out who owns one of these domains. So. The thing that could stick out to you initially is this. If it's owned by Microsoft, it's not going to say Mark Monitor Inc. But when you go down here, if you're not paying attention, you'll see organization, Microsoft Corporation, one Microsoft way, yada, yada, yada. Email domains at Microsoft. This is a red flag. Domains at Microsoft. (laughs) So they're trying to do little things where they make it seem like it's uh, owned by Microsoft, but it's not. But... That shows you how they try to go through and leverage your ignorance to think that you believe is that. Because if you look at it real fast, you know, I've I've worked phishing alerts sometimes where it's something that says it's from Microsoft or whatever, but I'm double checking, hey, is this one of their domains? Just because anybody can say whatever they want to. But you have to ask yourself, too, why would Microsoft, if you don't work for Microsoft, why would Microsoft be hitting you up to do anything on your computer? The same thing when they see those fake emails. Hey, your account's been compromised, and it's Microsoft. Microsoft don't really get down like that. They're going to send you a notification differently, and it's going to have, it's going to be legit. These external users set their profiles to a display name designed to make the targeted users think they were communicating with the help desk account, explains the new Relia Chris report. In almost all instances, we've observed a display name, including the string help desk, often surrounded by white space characters, which is likely to center the name Within the chat, we also observed that typically targeted users were added to a one-on-one chat. Well, LiveQuest says that they have also seen the threat actors sending QR codes in the chat, which leads to domains like qr.s1.com. However, they cannot determine what those QR codes are, QR codes are used for. And that's another one that I was talking to uh, my girl, actually. What was that? Saturday, we went out with the kids, and it was a business that had a QR code on it. And I said, the main issue I have with QR codes in a public setting is they need to have the link to where it should go to underneath the QR code. So if it doesn't go there, then you it's a fake. Because I was like, anybody with a lot of time could go make a QR code to stick on the window that was just like that and then just start social engineering people. And they think they're interacting with a business, but they're interacting with an attacker. You can go and do that in a restaurant where ain't nobody looking. Just cover all the QR codes with your own. <laughs> you can make it have the the same menus and everything and still be getting information out of those people. But let's keep it moving. The researchers say that the external Microsoft Teams users originate from Russia, with the time zone data regularly being from Moscow. The goal is to once again trick the target into installing any desk and launching quick assist so the threat actors can gain remote access to their devices. Once connected, the threat actors were seen installing payloads named antispamaccount.exe, antispam update, antispam connect us.exe. Other researchers have flagged antispam connect.exe on VirusTotal as system BC as a proxy malware that Black Boston used in the past. Ultimately, Cobalt Strike is installed, providing full access to the compromised device to act as a springboard to push further into the network. Relia Kiss suggests organizations restrict communication from external users in Microsoft Teams, and if required, only allow it from trusted domains. Logins should also be enabled, especially for chat-created events to find suspicious chats. But yeah, that all can still be mitigated from the get-go by just not letting people install remote desktop tools on the network without first getting all, it uh, help desk approved. How is they verifying these people? How do you know you're talking to help desk? It's just a lot. Yeah. Well, I think they're praying on, like, you got to think about it. They've overwhelmed. They find these people. They've sent them a lot of emails. So they are just BSing um, them through teams. Their emotions. Yeah. And the team should be locked down. Like like you said, like, 
if it is an external person, they it's need to actually help have desk. Them I ain't never seen no, I ain't never talked to help desk and it said help desk. Not once in my life ever. It ain't never said help desk ever. Just think about how many people yeah, that don't no, know anything about computers. Don't. It's going to say someone's name because you're at the like end I said, of the I day, said, you're still talking to someone nine times out of 10. It's going to still say someone's name. Man, I used to interact with people that I'm like, okay, can you go to your internet browser? And they're like, my what? I was like, Go down on the screen and see that big old blue E. I want you to click on me that when for I me. used to work at B. Or if it's gonna be a call like that, I would figure out how to just remote in because I was B&C like, I don't. Got the did time. have this technology so, though where it would allow us to mimic kind of uh, not we weren't in anyone's you know environment, but we were able to kind of see what a mobile user would see, so we could walk them better through what it looks like on from their experience, but. Yeah. Really? You said you said PNC? I know they mm-hmm. I don't know you work for It wasn't tech related, but yeah, I did. I didn't know. I thought you only well, worked at uh what's it the was place before, you said right before West Fargo. Oh, I so was in the finance, finance industry. Girly. It was in get out if you can. If you do doing what I was doing. Because I was doing customer service first and then I did collections. And they will hold you there for twenty years if you let them. And if yeah, West Fargo, <laughs> they'll kill you. Well, that's Piggyback off what we just talked about, and you go into the Amazon Caesar domains with okay. the remote desktop one. I think that's pretty cool. Let's talk about it. All right. So, Amazon Caesar's domains used in rogue remote desktop campaign to steal data. So, Amazon has seen seized domains used by the Russian APT 29 hacking group in targeted attacks against government and military organizations to steal Windows credentials and data using malicious remote desktop protocol connection files. APT29, also known as Cozy Bear and Midnight Blizzard, is a Russian state-sponsored cyber espionage group linked to Russia's foreign intelligence service. Amazon clarifies that although the phishing pages APT29 used were made to appear as AWS domains, Neither Amazon nor credentials for its cloud platform were the direct targets of these attacks. Some of the domain's name names they used tricked, tried to trick the targets into believing the domains were AWS domains. They were not, but Amazon wasn't the target, nor was the group after AWS customer credentials. Rather, APT29 sought its targets' Windows credentials through Microsoft Remote Desktop. Upon learning of this activity, we immediated we immediately initiated the process of seizing the domains APT29 was abusing, which impersonated AWS in order to interrupt the operation. The threat actors are known for highly sophisticated attacks targeting governments, think tanks, and research institutions globally. Although APT29's recent campaigns had a significant impact in Ukraine, where it was first discovered, it was broad in scope, targeting multiple countries considered Russian adversaries. Amazon notes that this in particular, that this particular campaign sent phishing emails to a much larger number of targets than they usually do, following the opposite approach of their typical narrow targeting strategy. Ukraine's computer emergency response team published an advisory about these rogue RDP attachments to warn about the mass email activity, which they track under UAC 0215. The messages use the topic of addressing integration issues with Amazon and Microsoft services and implementing a zero trust cybersecurity architecture. The emails included RDP connection file names like Zero Trust Security Environment Compliance Check. RDP that automatically initiated con- connections to malicious servers when open. So this is just kind of showing you what that looks like. We can see the path name is AWS Secure Storage, and then they have access to all of these items: drives, clipboard ports. Yikes. As can be seen from the image of one of these RDP connection profile above, they shared all local resources with the attacker control RDP server, including everything I just said. Moreover, 
UA CERT says they can also be used to execute unauthorized programs or scripts on the compromised device. So we can kind of see where they are located at. While Amazon says that this campaign was utilized to steal Windows credentials, as the target's local resources were shared with the attacker's RDP server, it would also have allowed the threat actors to steal data directly from the shared device. Yes, it just tells us how to go ahead and reduce the attack surface. But ATP-29 remains one of Russia's most capable cyber threats, recently becoming known for using exploits only available to spyware vendors. How about that? How does that cookie crumble? Interesting. Like I said, I always say that attackers typically, what their benefit is, is the time that they have to prepare their attack. So they're getting a little bit more advanced on preying on, like I said, at least the people's ignorance. Yep. Which is what? Because a lot of people don't. Which is why these companies don't have. The average person who doesn't work in tech or have any real tech experience outside of maybe gaming or just, you know, hopping on the web on your phone, you don't even know how outrageous things, how wicked it can get in this industry. And we've talked about, we've talked about Cozy Bear and Midnight, Blizzard, Storm, whatever. We've talked about them plenty of times this year. Ransomware, domains, all of it. The ransomware is getting out of pocket, though. Right. <laughs> the ransomware is getting out of pocket. I agree. And that makes me, I don't know if we're going to do it on this one. We may do it on next as well. So in my preparation, when I be talking to different companies, interviewing and stuff, I find different things to look up based on what I think they may ask me. Now I found some excellent articles on like things that have happened, like AWS, Bridget, AWS breaches, and I got to look for some for Azure too. And it's pretty cool. It breaks down like ransomware and AWS and how somebody moved laterally, what they did for reconnaissance, how they accessed it, like most people, a public S3 bucket or old access keys. But this made me think about like actually going through one of those articles and showing people how they could kind of be ahead of the game and answer some questions that they may not be familiar with, but saying, hey, well, I read up on this and I know attackers look for this, this, and this. So, um, that made me think about that. But while you were talking, guess what I stumbled upon on TechCrunch? It's an article about McDonald's, McDonald's? saying it could be a federal, cool, a federal. Author. Yeah, let's see. It says, I'm not going to share because it it's really short. McDonald's broken ice cream machine could get fixed faster thanks to a new federal rule. And it says, McDonald's ice cream machines have developed a lousy reputation for being broken when you visit a restaurant, largely due to strict copyright laws that only permit specially licensed technicians to legally repair them. The manufacturers have to license each technician and they put locks on the McFlurry machines to prevent others from preparing them. However, 404 Media spotted a new federal ruling on Friday declaring that technicians can legally hack their way around the locks put on McFlurry's machines by the manufacturer. This means that more technicians will be able to repair the McDonald's ice cream machine and it's widely seen as a win for the right to repair community. I Fix It, which posts how to, how-tos for tech repair, come here to posted a breakdown of McFlurry machines last year showing how to circumvent these locks with simple device which McDonald's previously asked franchise owners not to use. Now franchise owners are free to use them. What? Did you know cool. that in the first place? Because that's, that's all. You, what, knew they the were being, you knew they were being locked because only only he can fix it type type of situation? Be honest, I never I mean, asked. No, I didn't know if you had read that before in the past or something. I never, I mean, it's not public knowledge, obviously, but... I am shocked. That is a crazy reason to build up the reputation that the ice cream machines have built up. And then this next one I want to read. I'm not going to share it either. I just want to read it real quick. And it was like, Waymo has closed a $5.6 billion Series C funding round led by parent company Alphabet and joined by a who's who of Silicon Valley venture firms. Alphabet had previously announced in July that it was placing, I mean, that it was pledging another $5 billion to Waymo. And for y'all that don't know who Waymo is, Waymo are, is self-driving Ubers, pretty much. So if you don't like to talk to people, you don't want nobody to be in your car. I think Waymo is the the gray area between like if you can't get your kids somewhere, hey, I'm going to get you a Waymo. But the con is just them being in the Waymo and what if it goes wrong? How do you make sure people are protected while they're in the Waymo's custody? But anyway, 
Let me get back to the article. Waymo, but was mom on a specific saying only that it was a multi-year commitment. Andreessen Horowitz, Silver Lake, Fidelity, Tiger, Global, Perry Creek, and T. Rowe Price all joined the round. Waymo declined to say how much each invested. It's Waymo's second external fundraising round and its first since uh, $2.25 billion Series B in 2020 that eventually grew to $3.2 billion. The autonomous vehicle company says it will use the funds to expand into new cities and further develop its autonomous capabilities for business applications. Waymo is in some ways a much different company now that it was when it was raised the last round. At that time, the company was still plowing headlong into an autonomous trucking effort that has since pulled back from. Yeah, I think trucking was much more oh, dangerous outrageous. than just outrageous. driving through the city. People are very yeah. unpredictable. Yeah, you got to drive for everybody That's on the highway don't know how to drive, so the truck could be exactly. driving right, but food. Yep. And that reaction time is not still is not as fast as a human. You got to have a stable internet connection at all times with that satellite. At all times. Now, the only other way I could feel like it may be okay is if you had people controlling these cars, like like video games, like for certain issues when they start saying, "Hey, signal not stable" or "it's not reacting at a certain time." Hey, manually, you know, get on this thing, make sure let's see what's going on with the cameras. Oh no, way more if y'all listening, hire me. <laughs> The company has instead put nearly its entire focus on its robo-taxi ride hailing service. The bet has paid off. Waymo now operates commercial robo-taxi services in San Francisco, Los Angeles, Phoenix, and expanding to Austin and Atlanta. It's giving paid rides to more than 100,000 customers per week across these first three markets and offering trips to and from the airport in Phoenix. It's operating on highways in the Phoenix and San Francisco areas. I ain't gonna lie to you, Chief. I don't know about going on the highway in no Waymo. If you want to go down Marsh Lane and stop at the red lights and stuff, I'm good. Because all I know is if I get in the wreck in the Waymo, I'm getting paid more. <laughs> I would get in. Not on no highway, though, but I would Listen. definitely get in. On a- Well, Sinead and her husband, they just tagged me in that reel. I don't know if you saw it, but she was talking about the first time using Waymo, and they used Waymo to leave from a baseball game or something. And they liked it. Sign me up for a test. Next time you're in Austin, go ahead and go. Put that on my to-do list. And I think you're. I think the last one before we get into the funny stuff is how about you get into the fishing resistant multi-factor authentication? All right. Why fishing resistant MFA is no longer optional? The hidden risk of legacy MFA. Sometimes it turns out that the answers we struggle so hard to find were sitting right in front of us for so long that we somehow overlooked them. When the Department of Homeland Security, through the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency in coordination with the FBI, issues a cybersecurity warning and prescribes specific action, it's a pretty good idea to at least read the joint advisory. Uh, In their advisory, I won't read all of that, Um, the FBI told the entire cyber criminal stopping world that to stop ransomware attacks, organizations needed to implement phishing resistant MFA and ditch SMS based one time pin MFA. The best advice I never followed. This year, we experienced an an astonishing surge in ransomware payments with the average payment increasing by a staggering 500%. Per the State of Ransomware 2024 report from cybersecurity leader Sophos, the average ransom has jumped by five times, reaching 2 million from 400,000 last year. Even more troubling, Risk and Insurance, a leading publication from the cybersecurity insurance industry, reported that the medium ransom grew to 20 million in 2023, up significantly from 1.4 in 2022, while actual payments surged to 6.5 million compared to 335,000 previously. This alarming trend highlights the growing sophistication of cyber attacks and the weaknesses inherent in outdated security practices. The leading vulnerability across all organizations is the widespread reliance on legacy MFA, which is proving ineffective against modern threats. According to CISA, 90% of successful ransomware attacks 
start with fishing. After credentials are stolen, legacy MFA is defeated and the rest is history. Thus, the mandate to move to fishing resistant MFA. (laughs) We're all going to die. The rapid rise in ransomware and data breaches has created a daunting challenge for organizations struggling to keep pace with the constant wave of novel attacks. This surge is driven by major advancements in cybersecurity techniques. As anticipated years ago, generative AI has played a pivotal role in transforming cyber attacks, forcing many organizations to rethink their security approaches, but most have not adapted fast enough. The rise of generative AI has empowered cyber criminals to create highly convincing phishing emails, making them almost impossible for even the best trained users to detect. Gen AI has significantly advanced phishing attack methods, making them more challenging for cybersecurity teams to defend against. We know phishing remains a common way, the most common way attackers gain access to networks. Blah, blah, blah. Bring knife to a bring a knifey. Bringing a knife to a nuclear war. MFA has been a cornerstone of security for more than two decades, but ancient Legacy systems such as one-time passwords over SMS are no longer up to the task. Cyber criminals are easily bypassing legacy MFA solutions through phishing, SIM swapping, man-in-the-middle attacks, and more. Legacy MFA has been breached in the majority of ransomware cases, underscoring its inadequacy to today's cybersecurity environment. The adoption of phishing-resistant MFA is no longer just a recommendation. It's essential. Legacy MFA solutions are ineffective against today's sophisticated attacks. To combat the rising tide of ransomware and data loss, organizations must adopt next-generation phishing-resistant MFA solutions. These solutions are FIDO2 compliant incorporate biometric authentication such as facial recognition and fingerprints, making it harder for attackers to compromise. Hardware-based MFA, biometrics, and FIDO-compliant technologies can dramatically reduce the likelihood of successful phishing attacks and potentially save billions in losses each year. And that's it. What's your thought? Uh, It's a lot of stuff. (laughs) Just kind of, it's a lot of the post was like talking about a lot of different things. And I don't see it slowing up. Like we've been talking about the whole time that people are still, as we like to say, ignorant to different things. Uh, so whether they have the best of software, so they got the hardware token, they'll end up losing that. I've dealt with that when I used to work at the help desk. People have the RSA token. Hey, I forgot it at home. I need to get on my computer. So way you got to relax that policy. The one-time passcode is is like this. When it comes to a software one, because if somebody knows your password, all they got to do is hit you with MFA fatigue, and all you got to do is be squinting at night and trying to hit dismiss but hit the wrong thing, yep. they in your account. I mean, that happened to Uber. What was that, like two years ago that happened to Uber? The contractor had too much access. But the thing is, is you had to prepare for the... Not the if, but the when. Okay, when this person allows my in their network, we're going to make it to where, hey, you don't have a company-related device, so you can't log on to any of this extreme stuff that they have access to. So you may be able to see some in the SharePoint or something like that briefly, but that's about it. And you'll be out eventually. I think that is where AI will come into play. So AI will say... Hey, this person logged in from somewhere we don't really see them log in from. Let's send them a notica- notification to their work email. And let's see if that's really them. Someone that does that, hey, is it you? And it says, if person doesn't answer in 10 minutes, we will kick that's them just out of the session. Basically, conditional access, being dynamic, which is mm-hmm. kind of how the modern environments are. They are dynamic. You, They're changing. And as your identity credentials change or behaviors, they need to be making those checks at those access attempts in line with zero trust. I think for me, the big thing is it's a culture shift and cybersecurity is already, people already get stuck in their ways. 
Um, but as things advance and our environments become more and more modern, we need to find a way to, to implement change management more into how we go about caring for the security of our company because people are just kind of stuck in those old ways. They don't want to use biometrics, but you, mm-hmm. but you don't want to. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me try to read this funny uh, Reddit post. I didn't even read all of it when I screenshot it. It says, my ex is trying to ruin my professional reputation and career. And they say, so as you can tell by the title, this one is going to be a doozy. Around three months ago, I took my CompTIA A+. I studied extensively for it. I didn't blow it out the water, but I passed. I think I was five points above minimum score. A couple of weeks ago, I noticed my ex was creeping around my LinkedIn page after we hadn't spoken in a year. A week later, I get an email from CompTIA that they received an anonymous tip <laughs> that I cheated and that I had proof and that they had revoked my certification. I'm com- currently undergoing an investigation with my test taking proof just being suspended for a year. I asked them for proof, but they have yet to produce anything. They're trying to accuse me of taking my exam by proxy. I obviously did not cheat. I've been working very hard and I take my education seriously. I'm feeling a bit discouraged. I'm not currently sure what to do at the moment. Any advice? A bit of background. He has motivation and ambition issues. I tried motivating and pushing him to enroll in school, get any type of job. He wouldn't. When I showed passion and in getting into the tech field and started taking Google cybersecurity courses, he just started being generally unsupportive and negative. We shortly ended up breaking things off and then leave off on the best note. Fast forward a year later, not only am I enrolled in university, I have a job as an analyst. I got my first CompTIA certification and I moved to an entirely different city while he got kicked out of his parents' house and still doesn't have a job for three years now. Bro, is um, Bro is a hater. Period. Who, who else? Yeah, but I don't believe else? that. Okay, this could by all means be a lie, the whole thing. But let's just say it's not. Let's just say I it's not. It's like, who who is call, who is doing all of that? Who wouldn't? Who's doing all of that? And Comtia was just like, we ain't even messing with you. You're done. You're done. But the thing is, you don't take the test through Compte. It it's through probably Pearson, through Pearson. Yeah. But Pearson, so Pearson exactly. Sure you the whole time. Screen. They've they've asked me to, hey, can you hold your head up? Can you hey, can you not, can you not the cough? Out loud? Like they be on it. I'm like, really, bro? Like, I'm trying to get my thoughts together. Like, yeah, you, how you, go, you were at home. We're probably trying to watch TV. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. So I actually believe they capping. I, I feel like they capping. I feel like it just make for something that you can put on. Uh, I feel like it's make for a post that you can put on Reddit because everybody's putting some on Reddit. But I came across that and I thought it'd be pretty interesting to look at. But if you have an ex that's hated on you in your tech career, we, we love would. to hear the story. Put it in the comments or leave, or a leave us a voicemail on the techpod.com and we'll get back leave to you. Matter of fact, we'll send somebody over there to you. Matter of fact, just hold on tight. We'll get somebody over there to you. And I know you had a Reddit post too. It says flash drives and cyber attacks. In your career in cybersecurity, how often does a data breach occur due to someone picking up a flash drive off the ground and plugging it into their computer? I heard that it is common, but want to get some insight from people who work in the cybersecurity field. Someone said, I wouldn't say it's common for a person to load malware onto a flash drive, spread it around areas they want to hack and hope someone plugs it in. What is by far more common is someone's try to use a flash drive to transfer information they shouldn't, which various DLP software can help stop along with restricting rights. Someone else said it was more common back in the day. I believe there was a spike last year, but it was malware sent to users' home addresses, hoping they stick it into a company laptop. Someone else said it's not as common. Someone said restricted USB right access, so never dot 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 yet. Um someone says not common in my businesses. Um, they lock down most USB ports. They tell everyone not to stick things into the computer. However, my husband also works cybersecurity and some employee on a remote team someplace like Malaysia stuck a random USB into a work ser- into a work server and 
that was a mistake he was cleaning up for weeks. They they thought they had corn, you know what I'm talking about? So they went to check it out on a server in a comms closet. I think he said one of them got fired, but the other was junior and didn't get fired. Bye. And why would you stick a U.S.? You know what? First of all, they're supposed to be, they're supposed to be disabled and you're supposed to only be able to use a company approved uh, USB device. First and foremost, I've have, I've worked at places where you plugged it up, nothing happened. Nothing at all. Matter of fact, it's supposed to like break it if you plug it in. It's supposed to format it and mess it up. That's cute. Hey, now to say something, probably the happiest you will ever be is the day you come to work knowing you're about to type that two weeks notice. <laughs> Ooh, we ain't nothing like it. Ain't nothing like it. I'm talking about they done sent the offer. You've negotiated a higher salary, better benefits. You probably got more vacation time. You know what I'm saying? A bigger bonus, a bigger check all around. You done signed it, sent it back. When I tell you, you strut into work the next day. <laughs> Looking like Ric Flair, I'm telling you. <laughs> when I left my last job a couple years ago, and I put in at two weeks, I stopped code switching. I started wearing all my jewelry to work. <laughs> Stop tucking my shirt in. You know what I'm saying? Like... <laughs> I was still going to meetings, but mm, I might have contributed. I might not have contributed. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> what you going to do? Fire me? <laughs> hey, me I identify too. with that so much. Because the same thing, when I left my last job, I was like, I was like, you know what? I'm just waiting on y'all to tell me the wrong That's thing. That's how you I'm know waiting. it's time to quit. <laughs> Seriously. They was like, oh, yeah, we finna, um, they finna mandate y'all to come in instead of, uh, Two days, three days. I was like, I'm resigning. <laughs> I did that like so quickly, but I had to work there for like a month before I could leave. But it was like funny. And then they tried to make me do more work. And I was like, no, you're not going to make me do more work than work I was doing when I was like still like not leaving. You're not going to get when over I was, me like uh, that, pal. Leaving Wells so Fargo, I, I felt it was a bittersweet moment because like my team, we had fun. We was lit. We had a great time at work. But I feel like when I got the job offer that was making more than what I was making there, so much more, that I just felt like there's nothing they can say to me, period. Nothing. There's nothing you can offer me, nothing you can say to me. I am out the door. And ask me how much they pay me so I can tell you, please, please ask me. That remind me of Lee when uh, <laughs> Lee got that offer to go to the startup and he tried to get the... Um, Bank of America help that's to match it. And the manager's like, man, brother, you making what, what my manager's make, man. You need to go ahead and take that. <laughs> yeah. So that was funny. But now nah, when I left TSA help desk, I wasn't even making a substantially amount more. I was only getting 8K more just based off of uh, base. But I think overall, like 50. Well, really, I didn't even make the 50K because I started in – I think I started in July of 2016, and then I didn't last a year there. By the time March was around, I started my first security job. But I was even Bolger, Shreepa Bolger. I was like, I was hanging up on you people on the help desk. Sick. I was arguing. Hanging I said, what they up is do? crazy. Listen, I think they do that. I have been waiting to do that because, like, what you're not going to do is argue with me. I don't care nothing about this SLA. These people that held me back in this role, literally, them people held me back in that role. So I was like, nah, I'm finna, ain't nothing sliding now. Click. You're not going to argue me. Talk to somebody yeah. else. What they going to do? I'm yeah, going to We had this um, automated thing you were supposed to get on every day for X amount of minutes. I just had to go to the bathroom every time. Crazy how that works. Said, Look, I'm Period. in Ox One for a long Thumb time. Down. Like, listen, psh, better find, me. better ask about me. You better ask about me. I'm just gonna let you know now. I think this next one, um, it's a little bit more serious, and then we're gonna do this last one because uh, we'll we'll say the other one for another time. Or we might just have a video one day where. We may just have a video one day where we do nothing but freaking react to TikTok. So I think that'd be pretty yeah. cool, like on our live. live. We had like 50. 
We'll see. Let me share this again. But I think this is a good one because a lot of people are dealing with this and don't know. And then one of my my friends, he tagged me and they said, yo, this is literally what my company did before they laid us all off. So let's check this out, people. When an employer is trying to force an employee out of the company, it will often use a three-step playbook to get rid of that person. My name is Craig Levy, and I'm an employment law attorney. Step one of the playbook is micromanagement. The employee's supervisor will be all over them regarding deadlines, work product, how they communicate with clients and staff. The supervisor is going to be incredibly nitpicky, and the employee is going to feel like they can't do anything right, and that's by design. Step two of the playbook is documenting the employee's perceived bad performance. This could come in the form of a bad performance evaluation, performance improvement plan, or PIP, or a written reprimand. And the third step of the playbook, the company will try to force you into resigning. HR or the employee's supervisor will sit down with them, explain what's going on, basically say that things aren't going well and that a termination is upcoming, and do you want to resign? Typically, companies would prefer that the employee resigns because in that case, it's much harder for the employee to get unemployment. They take themselves out of the running for potential severance. And if there's any type of litigation in the future, the company's in a much better position when the employee has resigned. So employees should watch out for this three-step playbook. Companies use it all the time. I'm disgusted. So I thought that would be useful for the people, because you see that a lot of times, the micromanagement, the BS performance review, and uh, HR games, like, you see it a lot. And a lot of times you don't realize it's happening to you till you see it's happening to you. And uh, that's why I want to put the people on game with that one for real. Because uh, it, it definitely happens. And um, I won't say the company name, but yeah, they already were doing terrible business. They were also just getting contracts and not Structuring them the right way, losing contracts and laid off. Like I think most of the U.S. sock. Like it was crazy. Um, but you 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 realize that's what happens when you're an MSSP. And within a lot of couple of months, if they ain't not telling you, hey, that thing been extended for their contracts. Sometimes you just never know. So, or they did so cheaply on some of the other contracts that they're using maybe one major contract to float the whole company. It doesn't work out right. So, those are some things that you have to worry about. Uh, when it comes to that. So stay interviewing. You just never know. And sometimes it's not even like your main manager. It's just stuff to work politics. And so you just got to take care of yourself because at the end of the day, like we were talking about earlier with the robots, they looking at the ones and zeros. Like, you know, they're going to hit you with a no face. It's just business. That's what they're going to hit you with. What you think? If you're going through that, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry because it's just, I don't, I don't have anything good to say that don't involve cuss words, so I'm not going to say anything <laughs> right now. I don't have nothing good to say about that. So you a lot know. of beep to beep, 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 beep. So you scared to beep real you? I could beep it out. I mean, you just scared to be um, real you? No, I just going to be quiet. <laughs> I just think it's trash, for real. I, I mm. We know that it's the game. We've seen it happen to maybe some of our friends, some of our peers. It might have happened to you, so... I don't know. Just I just all I got is a lot of cuss words. I don't got nothing else to say but cuss words. Bet. And uh this is like the other one. I think this was pretty funny. Let me get y'all tea. So okay, so let me get y'all tea. So these work from home jobs, let me tell you. So I got an offer, right? Boom, boom, boom. Set up my um receive my equipment, set my equipment up, started training. Nice little vibe, like I'm not gonna lie. One of the best trainings. I've had in a work from home job. And the job is not even hard. But <laughs> this is the real part. Crazy. She was watching. So we're in the training. Team. Everything is going good. It's like a group of 18. Um, there's a trainer and then there's like a, I guess a moderator for the the chat that we be in. Anyway, so there's like a group of 18 of us plus those two. So we go through training. We go through Nesting, mm -hmm. right? So the first production, we get on the floor, or whatever, and like before our shift ends, like two hours before they pull us into a meeting, and we're like, "So you guys, you guys made it through training, yeah, I made it through um, nesting. How was it? Like, give us y'all feedback." 
everybody is giving their feedback. Everybody is, oh, yeah, you know, it's, it's not what I thought it was going to be. It's not as difficult as I thought, you know. I was just nervous. Whatever. Y'all, how about one of the girls that was in the training went through the nest and she gets on. She says, hi, guys. Um, I know I've, you know, introduced myself as something else. But my real name is yada, yada, yada. And I am one of the managers here. Baby, floored. Floored. Do you hear me? Like, why y'all undercover in these damn trains? So y'all getting them damn, uh, what they be putting us in? Them, them group outs, meet outs, whatever. Baby, be careful what you be saying in there. Because not only is the, it's probably recorded. I mean, duh. But <clears throat> these folks ain't playing. They ain't playing. I was so like, imagine what somebody probably just said. Just like think you talking to another trainee, and you talking to your members, girl. That was a good one. That was good. That's actually that's actually smart. But at the same time, why are you in nesting? Just starting out at the job, cutting up. You need to be on your p's and q's. I don't even think they was cutting up. I think they just really like regularly talking about different things and just not knowing that management is, that is in there. Is that not manipulative? And I tell like when I went, is that legal? Yes, it is probably or maybe not. I don't know. When I went to the work conference thing last year, I was telling everybody what I did. I was like, I'm gonna tell you straight up. I'm like, look, anything you don't want us to know, don't say it because we can see it all through logs. So people, listen up. Anything you don't want nobody to see. Do not say it on any type of corporate computer or corporate device because it's their property and they can see it. So I advise you to text it on your own phone, write it down, or don't say it at all. They definitely Because they can, can see it. it. They can see everything. But, everything. Every single thing you do. But you know, I, I feel that's a little shysty, though. Like, why you got a management person in there? Like, why not just say, hey... I'm a manager person from the beginning. I'm just in here to help you out with our questions. That's it. Like, don't try to be because I feel like you just sneaky got, with it. Yeah, that's a good you, way. Just to like you said, you don't there. immediately broke the trust with them. You're never going to get that back because it that's that it's weird. But I get it. They clearly have an environment where they felt like they needed to do that, right? I don't think so. I don't even know what type of job she does. I don't follow her. It just was different stuff that came across my TikTok and I was trying to figure out what type of job she might work. And uh, I may do some deep dive, maybe come at the next time and say, hey, back to the TikTok where the manager was in the chat, that girl does yada, yada, yada. So, I don't know. I'm just going to tell you, like I always tell people, keep your head on the swivel because like I said, in corporate is more crucial than the streets. Like, that's, they some real gangsters. Corporate gangsters are some real gangsters. That's what you need to be watching out for. But with all that said, Destiny kind of forgot her movies last time. So I'm going to see what she's been watching this last time or what come up in her head. I've been watching nothing that I'm about to say, but I'm going to say Lumos, which is a spell from Harry Potter that will turn the light on for you. Um, and I'm going to say Lumos. And so keep that light on and always be aware, cyber aware of the things that you're doing, the things that you could be doing that could be potentially exposing you, your data. Um, so I'm going to leave with Lumos and let cybersecurity be your guiding light to being more cyber resilient and cyber smart. Right. And what she left out is at Motel 6, they always keep the light on for you. For me, I was being challenged and I was thinking about Justin's family vacation. No, baby, let mama get him. Mama say crack, crack. Mama say crack, crack. That's Nate Johnson. That's all we. And it's Mac Johnson. That's all day. <laughs> it was this it was ridiculous. It, the brothers was cutting up. They was cutting up. It was all about two brothers cutting up. I'm the captain of the Sony. And we had, that's my favorite part. You know what's up? La Lizzle to Missouri. <laughs> that's the stuff for Sir Box Lot and Destiny. <laughs> Through the land of funk. The family <laughs> was ghetto. The races. It was a. It was brutal. Who said, hey, she family? That's definitely how that's they That's how be they be at the family reunions for real, though. They be trying to see. He said, what size some shoes is? 
my size. But with all that being said, people, use the voicemail feature on the textualtalk.com so you can leave us voicemails. That way we can answer your questions in real time on the podcast. Or if you're scared of the voicemail, use the email address to access questions. That'll be linked in the description. I'll have it on the screen as well. And also, y'all probably been missing out, but Destiny has been doing like 31 days of spooky cyber tips. So you have not been following her. You need to follow her. Well, y'all probably see this on the 31st. She may do Thanksgiving cyber tips. I don't know. But you need to follow Cyber Shorty. Y'all been doing a great job supporting the show. Y'all been like making everything go up. So I really appreciate y'all. Rock with y'all. Subscribe to the Patreon. Um I lost my new website as well. Well, not new website. I got it on a different platform. So now I got my stuff on Kajabi to where it's better paying for y'all. Like So now y'all guys can pay with Afterpay or Klarna if y'all ain't got all the money at one time. And also, I will be able to do affiliate links now. So if you got a following or you know a little bit something about security, I'll be able to make you an affiliate for the company and you can get paid to do nothing. All you got to do is tell somebody to use my services. So it's a, a win is a, a win. win. You know what I'm saying? But I don't any have any last me. words. Um, yeah, check out Spooky Cyber Tips. It's been fun. We are approaching the end of October. There'll be more tips to come for sure. Definitely looking forward to doing more for Christmas. But I don't, that's all I have. Lumos. Well, until next time, let's stay textual and we out. Peace.